This is five mistakes beginners make part two. And if you think you don't make any of these five mistakes or you're not a beginner, my guess is you're probably making mistake number four. And if you saw part one of five mistakes beginners make, you met my friend Danny, who I found off Craigslist. Well, today I have my friends Jack, JT, and Lily. except I'm paying them way more than I paid Danny. Let's do this. Here's mistake number one, big swings. In fact, in all of pickleball, you should be taking shorter swings, not bigger swings. Here's the first one, it's on your volleys. A lot of times we're at the kitchen line and somebody hits a hard ball at us and we take here, and that's typically what happens. Sure, I over-exaggerated a little bit, but not really, right? We take that big swing because pickleball is so fun to hit the ball as hard as we possibly can. So when you're at the kitchen line, right, and you're in your stance, you want to make your swings tight and you want to make your swings compact. So ball comes here, here, boom. Notice I'm in a stance right now and I'm moving my feet in order to allow myself to take short, compact swings. If you take elongated swings, you're gonna make more errors. Here's the second place you should take shorter swings. It's on your third shot drop. I want my paddle out in front and I want a shorter swing, right? Shorter swing. Notice I'm just lifting the ball right now. A shorter swing. We don't want this when we're hitting a third shot drop because when I have a bigger swing, I'm adding more energy, I'm adding more force, which is gonna sky the ball in the air and not allow us to get to the kitchen. And in turn, it's gonna create pop-ups for our opponents to put the ball away. Now here's the third place you're probably taking swings that are too big when you're at the kitchen line. We have four people here at the kitchen line in a stance. All right, that was a little too much, sorry. Was, <laughs> just making sure you're watching. Okay. All right, so let's say you're playing, right? And we're dinking, right? When I'm at the kitchen, I have short swings when I'm dinking, and I also short swings when I'm speeding the ball up. Notice I was able to create some deception because my short swing dink looked like my short swing speed up which put them in a bind and they didn't know what was coming. All right, here's mistake number two, and it's the one that I'm probably the worst at of all the mistakes I'm gonna teach you. And it's not even just a beginner thing, it's an everybody thing. I played in a tournament last weekend, a ball was literally going over the mountains behind me and I hit it. Mistake number two is hitting out balls. So most of us have heard the phrase, shoulder high, let it fly, or eyes high, let it fly, or way up high, let it fly, all those things. But it's easier said than done to just say those words and then do the action of letting out balls go out. So I'm gonna give you two cues or triggers that you can look out for when your opponents are about to hit their ball to help you realize when you should get out of the way. So let's assume that we're at the kitchen line and our opponents, which oftentimes happens in beginner play, are still in the midcourt. They think it's still fine to hit it hard there, which is fine, right? So let's say I'm gonna give a ball to JT and JT takes, and this is your cue, this is cue number one. JT takes a huge backswing from the midcourt. The chances that JT, a beginner that I found off Craigslist, is about to put enough topspin on the ball to get it to dip in is next to impossible. I have a better chance of being struck by lightning right now. Exactly, right? I'm gonna hit the ball to JT, big swing, JT. Boom. Jack and I are in position, okay? Taking a big swing. All right, exactly, right? <laughs> Beautiful. How did that feel? This is, is so fun. It's so fun. I'm like hitting the ball hard. <laughs> exactly. And Lily said it. People want to hit the ball so hard when they're first starting out. We all want to hit it hard. You will get a chance to hit it hard. Okay? Not, that's not the point of this tip. The point is, <laughs> Lily is taking this massive swing. If you see that, in your brain, you should be thinking, that ball's flying out. Easier said than done, I know, but it's the first trigger to think about. Here's trigger or cue number two. So number two is about what your opponent does with their footwork. It can apply to when they're hitting a drive. Okay? It can apply to what they do when they're up at the kitchen hitting a ball. Whoa, that was pretty cool. That was awesome. <laughs> it's about a change in footwork because it's very obvious, especially at the beginner level, what it looks like when a player is dinking by what their feet are doing. So right now, right, I'm probably not gonna be speeding this ball up. My feet aren't really doing a lot. What beginners do a lot of times is they get a little more frantic, take a big swing and hit it as hard as they can. So if you can get good at recognize one swing path, big swing, and two, a, a change in their footwork, you're gonna get really good at letting out balls go out, okay? So I might see a ball here, might see and notice if my third shot drop footwork is different than my drive footwork, okay? Now I hit that one in, but a beginner that you're playing against isn't gonna hit that one in. So when their footwork changes and they go to hit that ball, be thinking it's probably going out. Now, sometimes it will go in, right? But a majority of the time, just start letting it go out. Here we go. 
Ah! So next time you go out and play a wreck, let the first or second ball go out, or just let a few go out and just see what it's like. If you turn around and the ball lands in, that's fine. That's data. Because over the course of 10 shots, what you really want to be doing is winning 60 or 70% of those. So if you let 10 go by and six go out, that's good. And if it goes in, just say, Kyle, that random pickleball guy told me to. And your partner will say, yeah, that's fine. Here's mistake number three, short returns. Now, most players at the beginner level don't like when they're playing against bangers. Bangers are players that just hit everything really hard at their opponents. Let's do a quick example of that. Uh, go ahead and serve it, just return it, I'll be the banger. <laughs> we couldn't have had a better example. What if, what's going through your head right now? I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> so one way to beat bangers is to eliminate short returns. Because here's what happens. Let's go ahead and just walk through this. Jack, go ahead and serve the ball and then return it, Lily. If Lily returns it short, which she did right there, the ball landed inside of the kitchen. A few things happen. If she returns it there, number one, she doesn't give herself a lot of time to get to the kitchen. So right now, Lily's standing in the transition zone and I'm about to come make contact with the ball here. That's a very difficult shot for any player, much less a beginner player. If you return the ball short and then you're like coming in at the midcourt, not only do you have a tough time, like gonna, you're, having, you're gonna have a tough time getting that ball, this ball that I hit at you, right? That's, that's a hard shot, Yeah. right? But it helps me, in this case, say I'm a banger, right, who just wants to hit the ball hard. But even if I'm not a banger, cool, I'm just a smart player. Yeah. If I see somebody return the ball short, I'm going in and I'm hitting a drive to the player that's running in. Beginners often will say like, I hate playing against bangers. Well, no, bangers exist at every single level, right? Like, like I, I played a pro tournament last week. If you hit a short return, any pro player is hitting that ball hard at the person who's running in, all right? So let's go ahead and back to that. Let's run that example. <sighs> Right? So what do you do instead? Well, it's easier said than done, for sure. But you try to return the ball deep. And when I say deep, I'm talking somewhere maybe three feet from the baseline. So that you give yourself time, Lily, to get to the kitchen. And our job on our third shot serves the first, returns the second. Our third shot isn't as easy. A ball that gets returned up there is so easy. A ball that gets returned back here, it still can be, quote, easy, but it's, it's much more difficult than that shot and it gives you guys time to be more aggressive. And at the beginner level, most of the time when players serve it, they step two or three feet in. Anytime I get a deep return back, I gotta back up, which often leads to a pop-up or a missed shot. There's so many benefits to hitting a deep return. So I'm gonna serve it, JT's looking for a deep return. JT's gonna give himself time to get to the kitchen, then they're both in a stance looking for short, compact swings to block our first ball or to handle it. Here we go. Good. Good. And now you see that we're into a point, right? They made us work a little bit more by giving us a deep return. In fact, if we rewind that one more time, you actually saw me after my serve have to back up a little bit. If you ever see your opponent backing up off your return, that's a very good sign. If they're ever moving forward, panic. <laughs> so I'm, I'm serious, okay? All right, just kidding, but really. Here's the fourth mistake, no communication. The most persistent problem with communication is the illusion that it took place, right? So when we're in any possession on court, whether it's off our server, we'll just start here at the kitchen. I like to communicate on every single ball, even when it's obvious it's not mine. It looks like this. You. Me. You. Me. All right. It's a bit counterintuitive, but we actually communicate less with players that we're playing with that we don't know and we typically communicate more with the players that we're more comfortable with. But in reality, we should actually be communicating more with the players that we don't know, because we have no idea how they're gonna play. So you get a ball here in the middle, right? It, that can oftentimes be a confusing ball. And all of a sudden what you, hear, you see is, a lot of times ball goes to the middle, we'll clap paddles here. Ow. So, <laughs> so the reason I'm saying communicate on every single ball is because you're building the habit of high level communication. And I'm also removing any pressure. Ball goes over to Jack, yours, right? Of course, it's obvious that's his, that I can release any pressure of whose ball it is on every single ball that we hit. So next time you go and play rec, 
avoid the mistake of no communication and communicate. Just try it on every single ball throughout a point. You. Me. <laughs> Me. No, I'm just kidding. All right. All right. All right. We're just, we're, we're joking. Let's get serious. All right, here we go. I do have it though. Me. Here we go. Me. You. 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 Me. Me. You. Yeah, me. Lob. Me. You. 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 Give me yeah. that. Oh. Let's go. You. Yeah, you. Oh, God. Back up. <laughs> Big switch. You. You. Me. Watch out. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Here's mistake number five. See if you can identify what the mistake is before I tell you what it is. Ah. Uh, watch out. Ah! So Lily told me a story earlier today, and it was about a game she was just in, about when a pop-up, in fact, you just tell the story. I popped the ball up, I told my partner to watch out, and he said, no, I'll take it like a man. <laughs> and then, got crushed. <laughs> right in the chest, okay? So if you don't want to get hit right in the chest, and you see your partner pop a ball up, back to our spots, it's okay. You, in fact, it's more than okay. Lily, come up here. Okay? If a ball ever gets popped up and you notice, that's why you always keep your eyes on the ball, right? You should retreat immediately to give yourself more time and more space from your opponent, right? If JT's here up at the kitchen line and I go to hit a ball like this, there's a 0% chance that JT is gonna get that ball. Now, if JT sees a ball fly up and he retreats four or five steps and then gets balanced, do it this time, I'll pop the ball. He has a chance of actually getting the ball. Go, yeah. Boom, right? And he's able, to, he's able to retreat, and then he can work his way back to the kitchen line. All right? Don't be like our friend out there, and I won't, I won't say where you're located. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> A sixth mistake beginners make. I see this so much at public parks, in fact, hearing one player lecture another player about how you can never go inside the kitchen, as if this, this is like some like black hole or something, and if you jump in it, boom, you would fall through. That's wrong. You can step in the kitchen, okay? What, you cannot step in the, you cannot hit the ball out of the air when your foot is in the kitchen, okay? But if the ball bounces, you can step in the kitchen to go get the ball. Now, another thing I hear is that you can't step in the kitchen until after the ball bounces. It's like a little dance move. <laughs> oh shoot, I messed that one up. It's a, no, it's not a violation. It's not a violation, all right? You can anticipate the ball going in you can do this all day. Whoop! You can do this. This is, well, you can't do that. You cannot do that. You can do this. Come here. Okay. You would never do this, obviously, because the moment JT wants to, he would oh, do that and we lose. You also would never do this because if he tries to hit you with the ball, right? Go ahead and big swing. Yep, out. And that's the end of the video. If you want to learn the rules of pickleball or you have a friend that doesn't know the rules of pickleball, Click this video right here. I'll explain all of the rules of the game. Thanks for watching.